All right, thank you for joining me in this episode of The Gospel Truth. I just want to thank you for, you know, being a, a continuous uh, supporter of this ministry. Um, the Gospel Truth is here to engage the culture of Christian truth. And as you know, we are looking to try to get the gospel out there in any way, shape. You know, we're trying to get the gospel out there and I can't do it without your help. So I'm extremely thankful for your help and um, and getting this content out there and joining me uh, whenever I do live broadcast or record uh, or upload new content. Um, with that said, I do have an interview for you today. And Mr. Pastor John Speed has joined me today. And uh, John Speed is very, very active in the uh, community of fighting abortion. Um, and I think this is an area where it's must, much needed. And I don't think enough churches do it. I don't think enough churches are active in the fight against abortion. Um, so we're going to get him in and we're going to go through some of them, some of the issues in the area of where the body of church is involved, how much should the body, the body of Christ be involved, and um, just his ministry and what he's doing out there. But before I bring him in, I do want to go ahead and encourage you to go ahead and like and follow the Gospel Truth on Facebook and also on YouTube. Go ahead and subscribe there. And on both platforms, go ahead and hit those notification bells and so you can get notified whenever I go live and upload new content. Also, I have all this content on podcasts as well. So if you're one of those individuals who is on the go, uh, you can go ahead. Or if your data gets ate up by using YouTube, uh, you can go ahead and uh, jump on the podcast. Subscribe there. I'm on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. So I'm on every major podcast platform. So go ahead and shoot on over there if you just want to get caught up on all the episodes we have going on. Uh, but before I bring John, Pastor John Speed in, I do want to go over a couple of announcements that I have coming up. Uh, shows that I have coming up. Bring this up. All right, I have uh, a debate coming up, February 10th. I have Benjamin Duncan, and he'll be debating Joshua Olson. Uh, Duncan is a secular humanist, and Olson is a Christian, and they'll be debating, can the secular humanist framework provide a rational basis for genuine knowledge? That is a long-winded title topic, uh, but uh, it should be a fun one. That's going to be coming up February 10th, 2020, at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, I have also another interview coming up. Um, this is with Eddie Caparucci, and we're going to be talking about overcoming porn addiction and his new book, uh, How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction. And that's coming up February 12, 2020. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I have another debate coming up. Uh, Mercy Faye, Atheist, and Michael Holloway, uh, they'll be debating the value of Christianity. And that's coming up February 13th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And lastly, this is a big debate coming up. Dr. Jordan Cooper, who's a Lutheran, and Chris Date, a Calvinist. And they're going to be debating, is limited atonement biblical? That's coming up February 18th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Once again, this is just the next four shows that I have coming up. So go ahead and make sure you are going to YouTube frequently because I'm continuously updating the pages in order to make sure you're aware of all the good stuff that's coming up on the Gospel Truth. 
with that said, before I bring my guest in, Pastor John Speed, I do want to read his, read, let you know a little bit about him. It says, John Speed is a founding pastor of First Baptist Church of Briar in Azo, Texas. He's the author of Evangelism in the New Testament and a co-producer of pro-life documentary, Babies Are Murdered Here and Babies Are Still Murdered Here. He is also a regular contributor to Gospel Spam. John is married to Kim and they have five children. When he's not studying for a sermon or sharing a gospel, you can find him fishing, hiking, and backpacking in Texas. He's doing his thing. Let me bring him on in. What's up, John? Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, man, I'm so glad you came on, man. Um, I watch documentaries, um, and I, I, I'm very interested in your take on this whole thing of abortion in this country. So, uh, But before we jump into that, I do want to ask you, like, what other ministries do you have going on right now? Well, I'm the pastor of uh, missions and evangelism at First Baptist Briar, and so that covers a lot of area. Uh, we have a regular jail ministry that we do uh, every other Thursday night. We're out on the streets of Fort Worth, Texas, preaching every Friday night. Um, you know, uh, we always try to come up with creative ways to get the gospel out, you know, for the church to be involved, you know, for people who aren't really street preachers. We want to find ways to get them involved in sharing the gospel. And so that's that's largely what I do other than the abortion thing. Uh, we go to the abortion clinics um, on Saturdays. I hope to start doing that more frequently. And um, hopefully we'll start doing some campus preaching on college campuses as well. So there's a lot that we have going on. Okay, okay. So you do a lot of street preaching. What is what what is this? What is the most nervous aspect of street preaching? Because I I don't really do it. I really don't do. I think I like in my head and in my heart of hearts. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm gonna go out there. And, and I'm gonna buy me a, a microphone. I'm gonna get a, the whole setup and I'm gonna do it. You know. And then I'm like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> so, John, give me a rundown. Of what 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 is the most nervous aspect of street preaching? Well, it's really that few mount, a few moments before you step up to do it every single time. You know, it doesn't matter where you're doing it. You always have sort of this, you know, hesitation <laughs> to, to start. But once you actually open your mouth and you start, it all kind of goes away. Um, I've been doing this for, I guess, going on 16 years now. And... Um, that nervousness is always there, but the thing that I always try to remind myself is I need to fear God more than I fear man. Um, you know, and the minute that I fear man more than I fear God, at that moment I'm placing man on the throne that only God deserves to be on. Mm -hmm. So that helps me in those first few moments. I like that. I like that, man. Just always keeping that in mind, keeping that in your heart. That's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. Perhaps I will finally get my equipment and go out there and do it, man. I'm like, ah, I got to get it. I got to get it. So I have this vision in my head that I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, John. I think you're encouraging me. I'm, I'm going to do it, man. So good stuff. Good, good stuff. <laughs> All right. So obviously it's been a big, big, um, it's been a big deal in the aspect of when you close your bookstore. Um, I saw it on the news and I, well, I read on YouTube, I watched it on YouTube and I saw it on the news for that area. Um, and when you were in a process of closing your bookstore because of what they were doing with your taxes, taxes you're paying, it was funding the abortion, uh, funding abortions. What was the final draw? I'm sure you contemplated it. I'm sure this is something that has been on your heart for a while to do. Um, what was the final draw that said, okay, this is it. Enough is enough. There were a couple of things that were going on. Um, <laughs> the state of New York uh, in 2018, in that election cycle, they uh, the Democrats got com complete control of the legislature. And in January of 2019, uh, they passed the Reproductive Health Act, which made abortion legal right up till the day of birth. Um, it did some other things as well, 
but you know, abortion has been legal in the state of New York even longer than Roe versus Wade. It, I think since 1970 or 71, it's been legal in the state of New York. And so abortion has been part of the fabric of my entire life uh, growing up in that area. But um, what the way that they reacted when they passed that law, you know, they I guess they turned the Empire State Building pink or something. And, yeah. um, you know, they really the when they signed, they actually signed it into law. There was a lot of celebration. It really turned my stomach. And that's why we shut the store down just for a day on January 23rd, the next day. Um, but from that point up until August, when we announced that we were shutting the store down completely, I just got more and more involved in filming our sequel. Uh, Babies are still murdered here. Um, I got more involved in the fight to end abortion on other fronts. Uh, like the state level, um, I traveled down here to Texas to testify on behalf of a bill that would have ended abortion in Texas uh, last year. And so doing all of that, uh, I had the decision I had to make, you know, um, in addition to the tax, using the tax, sales tax money to support abortions, um, I just got more and more involved in the fight. And I had to decide, am I going to run a bookstore Or am I going to, um, you know, fight against this evil? And, um, you know, I talked to the church here in Texas that sent us to plant the church in Syracuse. And and in talking with them, we came up with a proposal that, you know, I would come back here and fight abortion in Texas. And, uh, you know, take over this, you know, create this position of pastor of missions and evangelism and serve here doing that. So that's what happened. There was a lot of things that happened, but if you look at what's happening in New York right now, they're getting crazier and crazier Hmm. all the time. They have a bill where they are talking about legalizing prostitution. Uh, They're talking about forced vaccinations for people, you know, regardless, you know, so much for my body, my choice that they're, they're going to force you to take whatever they want you to take for a vaccination. So it's just getting worse all the time. I don't, I think I would have left eventually no matter what happened, but, um, yeah, uh, it, it's getting pretty crazy up there. Yeah. That's, that, it's wild, man. Um, I do remember reading about them passing the laws. Um, and, uh, it's just mind blowing. It's almost, you know, it just breaks your heart. Um, uh, especially like you mentioned the whole, the celebratory aspect that they, that they did, you know, with the lighting of the lights. It's just this idea, like, you know, they take this, they take it to a, a level, an unprecedented level, you know, a president level of evil, you know, to celebrate evil, you know, and, and, and idolize this idea of abortion. You know, it, it's, it's just a horrible, horrible state. And um, I just think it touches on the, or it points to the, the depravity of the human heart you know, and, uh, the desires of that evil, those evil desires, you know, um, it just, it's, it's incredibly unfortunate. And, you know, when I heard that you closed your bookstore I was like, man, you know, this is a tremendous step of faith right here. This is a tremendous step of, um, of, um, love for Christ, you know, and, and, um, and not, and not support, not only not supporting, this not funding or assisting in funding um abortion but just i think when you did that it sent shockwaves throughout the christian community and saying that hey you know we have to be able to take that step and be able to be a, be a part of the solution instead of part of the problem if, if that makes sense um i think that's ex- incredibly admirable of you to do that um and like i said it's a tremendous step of faith and you know, I just want to encourage you as well, and I'll definitely keep you in my prayers and everything in that whole in that whole aspect. Um, that God will, you know, bless you and your family uh, throughout that. You know, um, that whole process. You know, that transition. I know it had to be tough. Um, so, speaking of your actions in fighting abortion, as far as with the church, um, what is what is your thoughts on uh, the current status of the church and its efforts, its overall efforts? Do you think that the church is 
in it enough? Uh, do you think they need to step up their game? Or do you think that, you know, that the church is in the right place? Uh, what is your what is your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that, uh, I think the church is more involved now than they were maybe when we did our first film in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, babies are murdered here. There's a lot. I know the end abortion now has about 500 churches, somewhere between 450 and 500 churches around the country that are going out to the abortion clinics to preach the gospel and to offer real help to the women that are there. And so that's a good thing. Um, and I'm very encouraged by that. We're seeing more bills that would abolish abortion being presented on the state level. And that's largely a church uh, back effort. And so that's a good thing. Um, I can see positive things along those lines. However, considering what abortion is, considering the fact that it's murder with malice aforethought, um, I, I don't think we're nearly as, as involved as we should be. Those are good steps, good good things that are happening, but there's a lot more that needs to happen. And I think most of what needs to happen is there needs to be a reassessment of the pro-life movement. Um, we need to reassess it biblically as to whether or not they have the right idea regarding the gospel and its, its prominence in this fight. Um, I think we have to look at some of their strategies that they have been involved in, uh, what they would call incremental steps, small steps towards ending abortion. After 47 years of that, I think it's time to reassess that strategy. It's obviously not working. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in education of the church and in mobilization of the church. But uh, there are things that are happening, and so I can be thankful for those things. All right, cool, cool. So what do you think is, like, if, if we look at the modern church that we have today, you know, we have um, um, churches that are not necessarily theologically inclined, if you will. You know what I mean? Churches that don't lean or don't, I guess, don't teach the Bible in the fashion that it should be taught. You know, when we think about these modern churches, why do you think that these modern churches aren't, I guess, involved in the fight against abortion? If they, if they quote unquote, have a love for God, um, what, what, what do you think is the reason why these modern churches have stepped, took a step back and not really as involved as they are now? Well, some of them are now than they were before. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've hit on it there at the beginning of, of your question. Um, I think it is a theological issue. Uh, theology always drives methodology. Mm. And so, um, you know, we, there's a gospel that's being preached in our nation that's a very much, very much an easy believism sort of gospel. No one ever expects anyone to seemingly to repent you know, to actually change their mind uh, and as well as change their actions regarding sin. And so when you have this easy believe as a message, when you have someone who has an abortion, um, you know, it, it gets treated as if, well, it's just a sin like any other sin. And, you know, as long as you believe that's in Jesus, that's okay we don't really expect there to be any change in your life. Um, we don't expect second Corinthians five seventeen to be true of you. And so, you know, that person could keep going back to the abortion clinic over and over again. And under this cheap grace that is being preached today in churches, that's okay. You know, here in the Bible belt, when we go to the abortion clinics in Fort Worth, what we see oftentimes are people pulling up with, Jesus fish on their bumpers, you know, or like church bumper stickers, pro-life bumper stickers on their bumpers. You know, they're coming in as pro-lifers having abortions. And the reason is because the gospel that's being preached in these churches 
can't change anyone because it's powerless. They're not preaching the lordship of Christ, that Christ, Jesus being God, demands our obedience. Mm. They're told, well, you know, we're all sinners, and, um, you know, we're all in need of this cheap grace. But Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 reveal that the grace of God that brings salvation that appears to all men has an effect. It actually changes the way that we live. And so I think it's really, it's an essential part of this fight to get the churches to preach a, a solid gospel message. What? Okay. So to get the, to get the churches to, what, would you recommend, what would you recommend in, in efforts to, to get the churches to preach this method, to preach the correct gospel? Would you say removing the pastors of those churches or anything and get them in line or would it be radical steps in that nature? What would be some of the, the, the ways that you would recommend? Well, I, I think we have to pray that God would stir a revival and a reformation across this country. It really, where it has to start as I, you know, these pastors are being educated in seminaries or Bible colleges. Hmm. Those places have to be preaching the truth. Um, you know, they need to be teaching the truth about the gospel. Um, that's where it starts. I think it starts with churches evaluating their doctrine. Hmm. You know, what we believe. Um, I think churches would do well instead of trying to reinvent the wheel every time they write a doctrinal statement, that they should become confessional in their belief and hold to some particular um, historic doctrinal statement, like the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession sure. or the Westminster Confession or something mm -hmm. that's historic and actually preach, you know, the theology of those confessions. Um, in a lot of cases, I'll tell you this, brother, I think it's a matter of pastors getting saved. <laughs> and yes, I, yes, I say, yes. I know that sounds radical, mm -hmm. but that's my testimony. Mm -hmm. I was pastoring for about 12 years when I realized that I wasn't really a Christian. And I began to understand these verses in the Bible, like Matthew 7, where Jesus says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and you know, done many, many mighty works in your name, and you'll say to them, depart from me, I never knew you, hmm. you workers of lawlessness. That was me about 12, well, know, it's been a while now, 16 years ago. Um, the Lord showed me I wasn't a Christian. And I think we, we need to pray that many of our pastors get converted. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. It's sitting in that, they're sitting in the pulpit, and their heart is truly not for Christ, man. So that's that's yeah, wild, man. It's definitely wild. So you mentioned incrementalism. Yeah, let me try to get that word. Incrementalism. Incrementalism, I guess you could say. Incrementalist. Uh, those who almost like a step-by-step, -step, you know, progressive nature of abolishing abortion or getting rid of abortion or, you know, changing the law to prevent abortions. Um, uh, what is your concern? Like, okay, so... You're an abolitionist, correct? So you, you believe that we should totally radically abolish abortion at conception, right? At conception, it should be abortion should be abolished. There's no get get rid of abortion. Would you say that the the abol the abolitionist position would be more biblical than the incrementalist position? And why do you say that? If if you agree, why do you say that? Yeah, I do. I do agree. And the reason why I say that is because nowhere in the law of God, you know, where God actually gave commands and how the people of Israel should live uh, when he actually gave them civil code. Nowhere does he ever say, well, you should regulate murder. He says instead, no, you, thou shalt not kill. And if you do, there's the death penalty. Um, God, God's law isn't, doesn't have shades of gray on this issue. It's very black and white. Mm -hmm. It's very much definitive. And so I think if we're talking about a Christian worldview, if we're talking about a biblically informed Christian worldview, 
I think that we have to go in that direction because um, that is how God deals with it. You know, we're called to do justly and to walk humbly with our God. We are called, uh, Isaiah chapter 10 says, woe to those who write iniquitous decrees, um, laws that are rebellious and wayward from the law of God. God says judgment upon them if they, if they do that. Well, when you have laws that do things like say, okay, um, we're going to put a heartbeat bill into place and everybody knows in the pro-life movement that the abortionist who does the ultrasound can, can um, fudge the ultrasound. They can take that wand on the ultrasound machine and just move it a couple of inches and make it look like a blob of cells instead of a baby. Everybody knows that in the pro-life movement, and they're willing to leave that loophole in for the abortionist. But the reason why they, they push for the heartbeat bill is so that they can feel like there's, ha there's some progress taking place. When the heartbeat bill is not saving lives at the degree that the pro-life movement would have you believe it. And so that's an iniquitous decree. That's a law that rebels against the standard of God's law and is really unenforceable. And so God doesn't write unenforceable laws. He writes enforceable laws. And so as Christians, we are accountable to do is that, that they really just are uh, writing laws that are in rebellion against the law of God. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, but wouldn't you say that w while babies are not being saved at the rate that the pro-life movement may consider uh, or make us think, w would you not say that something is better than nothing? You know, as far as the aggressive nature, as far as um, the... Okay, so I, I would say like the abolitionist position would be more in your face. Like, hey, <laughs> like get this done. Let's go. Let's get this done. Let's knock this out. Where the incrementalist is more not so in your face, but they're willing to take whatever the government gives them. You know what I mean? So would you not say that something is sort of better than nothing, if that makes sense? Yeah, I know what they're saying with that. And I do acknowledge the fact that on occasion that in spite of the loopholes, the abortionists mess up and one or two slip through. But I'll tell you, that's about what it is. We're not talking even about thousands. We're talking about handfuls. Now, I'm grateful for each baby that's saved. However, the truth is, you know, for 47 years, we've been taking these small steps and, you know, taking these these small steps that do more to make people feel good about being pro-life than to actually accomplish anything. And so what, what I'm saying, I can't speak for any other abolitionist, but what, what I'm saying is, is look, uh, let's, let's try to aim for the complete end of it. Mm -hmm. Let, you know, I, I like to shoot, you know, I hunt every now and then. So I've got guns. I like to shoot my guns. Well, when I'm aiming my gun, generally I hit what I'm aiming at. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you. there's another phrase that says, if you aim small, you miss small. Hmm. So if you aim as tight as you can to what you're trying to hit, you miss that, that tightly as well. The pro-life movement's not using, you know, a sniper rifle. They're using a shotgun, maybe, um, you know, maybe a shotgun. Uh, they're they're trying to hit whatever they can hit. Mm -hmm. What I, what I think it's more consistent from a Christian worldview, and just considering the nature of what this is, the her, the horrific nature of abortion should give us some sense of urgency that we need to end this thing completely. And that's what I see utterly lacking in the pro life movement right now. They're very comfortable. Uh, having theoretical discussions that and theoretical laws that will not save very many at all, if any. And so I think we need to be more realistic about this thing and a little, a lot more urgent, a lot more urgent. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I guess my own position is I'm more. I, I I like. I would like to see abortion totally eradicated. You know, from conception. You know. Um, and. You know, but at the same time, sometimes I'm like, all right, well, perhaps we're getting somewhere. You know what I mean? Uh, I remember when I first read about the heartbeat bill and I was all like, OK, that's something, you know, that, that's something, you know, something we can grab hold of and, you know, progressively get there. Uh, but then I watched Babies Are Murdered here and I was like, OK, perhaps <laughs> and I'm like, perhaps, uh, maybe it's not getting there. Yeah, maybe it's not getting there than I thought it was, you know. Uh, so I'm kind of bad. I'm kind of like, I'm on your side of the argument. But then at the same time, like, is there any way that we can progressively get there? Is there any other method that we can take to get to where we need to get to for these babies? You know, um, but I do feel that the abolition position is the more biblical way of going about it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the the thing that I I think a lot about is the fact I, I know what people say. You want to play all the plays, you want to um, you know, do whatever we can to move forward. But we really, I think, what is lacking in the pro life movement is any really serious evaluation of what these individual bills have actually accomplished. What I mean by that is last year in the news, Georgia was all over the news because they came up with a law that was more aggressive than most to try to end abortion in Georgia. Well, I've got a good friend, or well, I'm thinking of a couple different states, Georgia, Alabama. Alabama is the one I'm thinking of right now. So in the state of Alabama, they had a very aggressive law. Well, I've got a friend who goes to the abortion clinics in, in Alabama daily. He's there every single day. And I asked him not, you know, not long ago, hey, man, what's the effect been of these laws in Alabama? Have you seen any slowdown at the abortion clinic? And they're not even seeing a slowdown. They're not even seeing these laws slow, like slow it down. Hmm. So, so what I'm saying is, the pro-life movement has a lot of investment, financial investment, time investments into uh, what they've done. Uh, it's a political investment, largely. Uh, and the Republican Party is very closely tied in with all this. And the thing is, if they can keep a, um, a, an illusion of victory, which is what they do at the March for Life every year in Washington, D.C., create some sort of illusion of victory, then what they can do is justify their own existence and they can justify voting for the Republican Party every, every time they have a chance. And so I know that sounds really pessimistic, but if you spend any amount of time watching what's really going on, it doesn't take long to get there. It's very disturbing when you see what's happening. Mm hmm Interesting, interesting. So I'm going to um, pick your brain real quick as far as your level of expertise in the field of street evangelism, right? So we have women out there who are considering getting abortions, right? And you run into a woman that at the at the baby mills, I know we like to call them at the baby mills, um, what is your approach to evangelizing a woman um, who is considering abortion, who is really having a hard time and in a really tough situation? Her parents are not with her having a baby. Uh, the guy she laid with um, is pushing her to have a baby, uh, have an abortion. Uh, what would be your methodology for my audience and, you know, anyone else watching to that way come and view this 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 video later what would what would be your your uh, your recommendation to evangelize someone in that situation well i can tell you what we do uh, the first without well, the before i do that the first thing that you kind of have to realize and i tell new people this when they show up at the clinic the first thing that you have to realize is that the majority situation at the abortion clinic is not some 
woman who has no support and is poor and impoverished and is doing this because they have no other option. There are those that are in that situation, but that's not the majority of the women that are out there. The majority of the women that go to an abortion clinic go there for a whole host of reasons. Most of them are selfish. Um, most of them are just flatly selfish. You know, they want to finish their co- they want to get their college degree, uh, and so the, getting that matters more than the life of the baby. Um, some women will tell you. I, I saw a case here just last week where somebody went to an abortion clinic because she was having morning sickness. Hmm. You know, so, you know, that's the level. And you're seeing people come in uh, where we are in Fort Worth. We see people pulling in there in Tesla vehicles and uh, Mercedes Benz in Hummers. You know, this is not a financial issue. Hmm. The reason why women go to get an abortion is because they're selfish. And so if you're going to share the gospel with somebody, it always starts with the character of God, first and foremost. But then it also deals with the sinfulness of man. Hmm. And you've got to call some of that out. So the way that we do that is we'll have people by the road with signs that uh, some are graphic and some are not. And um, and then we have a couple of women by the um, entry of where they're pulling in. They're pulling the car in. And the women at the entry will offer literature to the women as they come in. And they'll try to speak with them. And then they'll pull in and they'll park. And then from that moment, we have a very short period of time. Well, what's been happening all along the whole time that we're there as these people are pulling in is we have people preaching the gospel on amplifiers in the parking lot. Now, when that door opens and the woman gets out, the preaching stops. And then we have individuals call out to the women to try to get them to come over and talk to us. And so all of that goes on, and if, if they don't come over, we've only got about 15 or 20 seconds before they hit that front door. The escorts are trying to distract them, trying to talk to them, sometimes holding up umbrellas so that they can't see us. Um, and they try to get them in as quickly as they possibly can so that they can keep money flowing. Um, and then what, what has happened recently... Um, there's a parking lot right next door to the clinic that's a city parking lot. And if we get somebody that is thinking about keeping their baby, we just direct them over to that parking lot and we share the gospel with them. In one case, I was able to take the couple, uh, both the abortive mom and dad were both there. And I took them out to, to breakfast and we sat for about an hour and I shared the gospel with them. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's what it looks like. You know, you, you're trying to maximize the impact for the little bit of time that you have. Um, and then you're trying to make a connection and then, you know, go on, go on over and, and talk further, you know, develop a relationship enough that you can talk further with them. And so that's what we that's how we handle it. OK, so the situation where, OK, a woman, a woman that doesn't. OK, a woman says, OK. Uh, Pastor John, I'm not going to get an abortion, but I don't want the baby. I don't want the baby. What 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 do we have in place there? Because I think this is a big thing, Pastor John. My church is involved with, you know, assisting uh, crisis centers, you know, that bring women in who are in a crisis situation as far as being pregnant or unwanted pregnancies. And one of our major concerns is that... Um, someone who doesn't want a baby and do we have places or families who are standing by who are looking to adopt these children? Um, when obviously when she, uh, when a woman gives birth. Um, so is that something that you guys in your efforts, um, that you guys have in place already, or do you sort of do it by a case by case basis or what, 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 what would you say about that? Yeah. I mean, I have, I have uh, the phone numbers of a couple of different people who are already court approved to adopt. Mm, okay. um, so that's there in place already. Uh, but the issue is, and again, this is another misconception that's fed largely by the pro-life movement. Uh, adoption, 
uh, occasionally happens that way, but it doesn't happen that way very often. Okay. And again, the main reason is because what the women need when they show up at the abortion clinic is a reminder that the baby in their womb is not their body, it's a baby. Gotcha. And once they respond to that, once they respond to that truth, what we have seen consistently, and my friends who have been doing this longer than me have seen it consistently, they keep their baby. Mm -hmm. um, the they, Adoption, uh, is, we should have those things in, in place, I, and that's why I have you know, those phone numbers. But the thing is, is there's my, my friend John Burroughs, who's in Babies Are Still Murdered Here and the first film, He's seen 2,000 babies that he can verify uh, rescued at abortion clinics. He has had one case in 15 years of somebody adopting a child from mm. that out of 2,000. Wow. Just one. So while I think it's good to have it on hand, I think a lot of times we have these ideas from crisis pregnancy centers and from pro-life movement that we must have these things you know, locked down and in place because there's just so many of them. That's not true. That's just patently false. Um, we can show it from the, the women who've kept their babies, you know, who've been involved with end abortion. Now the churches that go out there and preach out there in front of the clinics, what we're seeing instead is people just keeping their babies and having, and which is wonderful. That, that should be the goal. And so I think there's a bit of a misconception about the, um, adoption issue okay okay yeah so okay so many people would say i guess i've heard anyway that um certain methodology is too aggressive and the women don't want to listen you know with the signs in front of them for someone pretty pre pretty vivid you know pretty pretty you know it gives you a, a <laughs> It touches the heart, man. There's no way you can escape it, man. And like you see it, you're like, whoa, you know, you're blown away at it. You know, um, what would you say to somebody who says that that's why the, you know, that's why that approach is not effective because <laughs> it's too, it's too aggressive. It's too vivid, you know, and all it does is turn people off. So what would you say to that, John, Pastor John? What would you say? <laughs> I, I honestly, I laugh at that anymore because the truth is uh -huh. it's far more effective than what they're doing. Um, far more effective. In the last five weeks, we've seen four babies, four parents decide to keep their babies that we can, we've got their contact information and we've communicated, you know, we communicated with them at the clinic gave them information, gave them our information, and we got their information. That's There was four in the last five weeks. And then there's been uh, something like five or six turnaways where we didn't actually get to talk to them, but they left the clinic. So there's somewhere between nine and ten babies in the last five weeks that, have, that we know of that have been saved because of our efforts at one abortion mill. Now, 40 days for life gets that kind of thing, you would read about it in their national newsletters because they don't get that kind of response. Um, you got a guy like John Barros who's been going out there full-time for about nine years, been doing it in some fashion or another for 15. He can point to 2,000 confirmed saves. They can eat all of 40 days for life, I don't believe, can, can point to those kinds of numbers. And that's just one guy. <laughs> That's just one guy hmm. at one clinic. Um, so I laugh at it anymore. I don't take it seriously at all. When these people say, oh, yeah, you know, that doesn't work. I, I'm like, man, I've seen what you guys do. I stood out in front of the Planned Parenthood with 40 Days for Life, right next to the lady who was the head of the thing. And she was calling out to the women as they were walking in. And she was so soft spoken that I could barely hear her. And I was standing next to her. Hmm. And I'm, and this is the approach. We need to be gentle. We need to be soft. If we believe that babies are really being murdered there, I defy anyone to take that approach. I mean, if, if we really believe that's murder, then how in the world can you, with a good conscience, take the approach that we're going to be soft-spoken and quiet about it? 
We need to call out to them. They already know it's murder. We're just bearing witness with what their conscience already reveals. Mm. And so uh, what we have seen is fruit from this ministry. People like Abby Johnson that say this stuff, people like 40 Days for Life that say this stuff, they don't know what they're talking about because they don't ever do it. Hmm. They don't ever do it. They don't know what the fruit is. They've never done it. I've I've stood with the 40 Days people, and I've seen it. And in Syracuse, they say, well, we've had 12 rescues. Well, the first time I met with them in 2011, they told me they had 12 rescues that they knew of in like 20 years. And they were like bragging about that. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I really get livid about that because mm-hmm. it's a lie. It's a, it's a straight up lie that they're telling. And that's why I'm thankful. You know, that's why I'm thankful that you um, that you chose to come on here because, you know, um, there are a lot of misconceptions out there, you know, with that approach and and with the abolitionist position. And it, it's always it's. It's bringing things to light, bringing things to the correct understanding, you know, of someone who is actually in the trenches, you know, not someone that's actually on the outside making judgments, making making statements, but people who are actually in the trenches, who are out there daily doing what they need to do. And that's why I'm glad that that you came you came on to talk about this subject, because um, that's definitely what I wanted to do. I want to clear the misconception. Um also, um, what was, I think, oh, I have one more question for you. Well, I have two more, but this is one of them. Um, okay, so the political the political realm, right? We got the Republican Party who every four years or every year they're looking to vote, get voted into an office somewhere throughout this country. You know, they love to pull the pro-life tag. You know, and that's going to draw the Christian in, you know, the Christian vote. Let me get the Christian vote. Um, What are your thoughts on that? And how should like how should we as believers in the church approach that? You know, because because in one instance, we're like, okay, we definitely don't want to vote Democrat, you know, because we know what they're about. But at the same time, we're between the rock and a hard place because yeah, we want to vote Republican. But at the same time, it's like, what, do we really feel that the Republican Party is going to take steps to abolish abortion or, or take serious steps anyway to abolish abortion? And also you got same-sex marriage, the whole nonsense about that out there. So what is your, what are your thoughts? And I'm really interested to hear this. This is one of my, one of my questions I really want to hear you answer. <laughs> Out of all the questions, I really want to hear you answer this. What are your thoughts on this? Because I think this is something that Christians really have a hard time dealing with. You know what I mean? It's like I said, it's like being between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, you know, I think the problem is is that we have we have this idea that if abortion is going to end, it's going to end through the federal government doing it. Hmm. And um, so we look for the president to appoint Supreme Court justices with the idea that maybe eventually they'll overturn Roe or we vote for the president hoping that maybe, you know, he'll do something by executive order to try to end it or that maybe he will sign a law if the Republicans can put a law into place. So that's the hope is Washington. We hope that if we vote there, that's where it'll happen. What I've been involved with in the last year is a is a more of a grassroots thing that I th- I think we need to readjust our thinking. I think we need to look at the fact that our local municipalities, our cities, our towns, our villages could do something to end abortion in their cities, towns and villages. So we could go to the city council and petition them to end abortion in those areas in our municipalities. We could go there and say, let's put forward a law that says it's illegal to get an abortion in our town. And so if you had a Planned Parenthood in town or an abortion clinic, you shut it down and get them out. If you don't have any of that in town, you make it so that they can never come to begin with. If they're selling Plan B or morning after pills at the Walmart or in the pharmacies, you make it so that it's illegal to sell those things in the Walmart or in the pharmacies. And you 
you know, surgical abortions performed by OBGYNs or in hospitals, you make all of that illegal in your town. We have a better chance of that than ever having Roe overturned by the federal government Mm -hmm. because, you know, in these smaller towns especially where people tend to be more conservative, uh, they're at least willing to talk about it. Um, Whereas on the federal level, on the national level, they they're so national right to life and other groups are so invested there that they only go with that strategy uh, that has millions of dollars behind it. But local churches in small towns can make a real statement by saying we will not allow it here. And so um, that's something I've been actually the reason I'm sitting in my car today. I'm in, on my way to Oklahoma City. And tomorrow I'll be teaching on this concept at, uh, Abol- at Abolition Now. It's a uh, it's a rally and a event that's being put on by Free the States, where I'm talking about the the local municipalities trying to make their cities safe for the unborn. Um, and I think I think that we need to have a real. I think if we do that, we have a real chance at um, getting some momentum to end this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think, um, if I have my history correct, actually the, the Supreme court justices when Roe versus Wade actually got passed was majority conservative. If I, if I have my history correct. So just to throw a little perspective and context there that us relying on the political realm to rid the world of abortion is sort of far fetched, uh, considering that was the, was the majority in the Supreme court, at the time Roe versus Ray was actually passed. So it's very interesting, very interesting. It was also the majority. They had a conservative majority in 1992 uh, with Casey versus Planned Parenthood, Mm. which was another attempt. Um, And that conservative court uh, upheld Roe. (laughs) So it's a pipe dream to think that they're going to ever do anything about it. Uh, We need to take it to the, Local and the state level. 10-4, 10-4. Cool, cool. That makes, that's interesting, man. It's an interesting approach. And, you know, um, yeah, I think, we, I think that I think that would probably be a good way to go about it. So we talked about a whole plethora of things, Pastor John. Um, we talked about, you know, what are the differences between incrementalist and abolitionist, the approaches difference, what naysayers say. But the most important question that I have for you, Pastor John, is the gospel truth. Um, if you can go ahead and give me a rundown of what is the gospel truth. Well, the gospel truth is, is that God is a holy God. He is a just God. He's also a God of love and a God of mercy. And he created us in his image, the Bible says. And, you know, Adam and Eve fell from grace in the garden. They disobeyed the one command that God had. Since then, we are sinners. We're we're, um, born into sin, and we sin because we are sinners by nature. And every time we lie, every time we steal, take God's name in vain, look with lust or commit adultery flat out, you know, we show that we truly are sinners. And so we rebel against God. That's that's who we are. We say, God, I think I know better than you, so I'm going to tell a lie in this situation to get what I want. Or we say, God, I know better than you, so I'm going to steal rather than trust you so that I can get what I want. Uh, or I, you know, I know that you say that I should be content with my, my husband or wife, but uh, I need more than that, so I'm going to do what I want. And so we rebel against God. Um, but the gospel truth is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for sinners. He rose again from the dead and conquered death so that if we will repent and turn from our sin and turn to Christ alone in faith for our salvation, we can be declared right with God, not because of our works, but because of Jesus' obedience to, to the law of God and his, perf- his perfection. And so, uh, you know, that's what, if you're, as you're listening to this today, I would beg with you, beg with you, plead with you, uh, no matter what you've done, no matter 
if you've had an abortion or um, or just told little what you consider to be little white lies. Uh, you need to repent of your sin and place your faith in Christ alone, and your sins can be separated as far as the east is from the west, and they can be buried in the deepest sea and remembered no more. God promises to do that if you will humble yourself before God, turn from your sin, and turn to Jesus Christ alone in faith. Uh, we can't earn it. We don't get there by going to church. We don't get there by being religious people. We get there by turning from our sin and placing our faith in Christ alone. Because he died on the cross for sinners and rose from the dead. He is God in the flesh. He is the only one that can make us a real offer of salvation. And so you need to run to him for mercy. Amen, amen. And that is the gospel truth. Man, good stuff, Pastor John. <laughs> good stuff, man. Hey, thank you so much, Pastor John, for joining me. I know you said you're on the road and you say you're on your way to Oklahoma. That's right. Yeah, man. So are you, I hope you get some rest, man. Don't be out there driving too long, man. Stop and get something in your belly, get something to eat, get something to drink, <laughs> you know, and I'll be praying for your safety, man. And once again, I'll be praying for your, your church, uh, your ministry, um, end abortion now, um, all that, man. Um, and once again, thank you for your time, pastor. Um, and, um, I look forward to seeing what else you have next, man. I, I, I hope you're coming out with a babies are still are still still murdered here. You know, hope you know what, Pastor. I hope you don't have to come out with no more movies. I hope the, the I hope everything. Uh -huh. I hope all the uh, the abortions stop, man. So you don't have to keep doing these movies, man. But right, and if it doesn't end, man, which I'm pretty sure it won't, because this world seems they love this stuff. Um, I'm praying that you put another one out there just to keep the awareness there so it doesn't go quiet, you know, and that people continuously, this is continuously put in front of people so they know what's going on out there. So good stuff, Pastor. I appreciate right. you very much. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, folks, that is the episode of the Gospel's Truth this time around. And you know, it's always a joy to bring individuals on that are willing to take time out their busy schedules who know what is going on out there, man. You know, and a lot of misconceptions were, re were rearranged today, you know, and I pray that, you know, that you will consider um, what Pastor John Speed said. You know, if you're out there and you said you, you think you know what's going on, but I, I pray that John Speed has put you back on track and corrected those misconceptions. Um, but um, it, it's always a joy, man, to get this stuff out there and continuously doing it. Speaking of getting stuff out there, uh, I encourage you to go ahead and like and follow The Gospel Truth. Subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe on the podcast. All the information is there. All my content is there. Um, and go ahead and get it out there so people, not only you watching can see this, but others can too. Um, it's important to get this stuff out there. But before I get out of here, let me go ahead and go over a couple of announcements that I have coming up. All right, once again, coming up February 10th, I have a debate. Benjamin Duncan versus Joshua Olson and Evan Bacon. Can secular humanist uh, framework provide a rational basis for genuine knowledge? And that's coming up February 10th, 2020. Uh, then I have another interview uh, with Eddie Caparucci, and they'll be, we'll be discussing overcoming porn addiction and his new book, How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction. That's coming up February 12th, 2020. Mark the calendars for that. Um, I also have come up another debate February 13th at Mercy Fade versus Michael Holloway, and they'll be debating the value of Christianity. And that's February 13th, 2020. And then lastly, coming up, this is a big one, Dr. Jordan Cooper, Lutheran, Chris Date, Calvinist, and debating is limited atonement biblical. That's coming up February 18th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Once again, this is just the next four shows. All the other content, all the updates, all the other shows that are coming up are on the YouTube page. So don't hesitate to go over there, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and stay up on par of what we have coming up. But with that said, I'm going to get on, get on, get out of here. And I once again want to thank you for joining me on this episode of the Gospel Truth. Be on the lookout for our next episode coming up on February 10th. And may God bless you and may God keep you.